Okay, welcome to Immune Pharmacology 2. We're going to go over antifungals and antivirals and um, be a little more specific about that, but we'll first cover antifungal medications. Next, antimycobacterial agents, fancy way of saying TB or tuberculosis. Three is the non-HIV antivirals, and then four is going to be the HIV antivirals. So for fungi, not bacteria, or viruses. So the two major categories are the systemic mycoses and the superficial mycoses. So the systemic mycoses are those that are in the bloodstream. And then the superficial mycoses are those that are uh, either dermatologic or outside the body. So nystatin for thrush, fluconazole for vaginal yeast infections, butenophene, maybe athlete's foot, things like that. Amphotericin B, which is fungazone, or nystatin, which is mycostatin, uh, these bind to sterol. They're polyene antifungals. Uh, they bind to sterols in cell membranes and increase permeability. So cations like potassium, sodium especially, they can be fungostatic or fungicidal based on the concentration. So just like we had bacteriostatic and bactericidal, a fungostatic is going to stop the growth and then fungicidal will kill the fungi. They're really toxic because they also bind to human cell membranes and they bind to cholesterol and causes the same effect. So fungal cell membranes, cell membranes have ergosterol while we have cholesterol. And because those look alike, that's where the danger comes in. But again, some of these systemic fungal infections are life-threatening, so it's really benefit versus risk, and the benefit outweighs the risk of death. Antifungals or azoles are like fluconazole or diflucan. Uh, this inhibits ergosterol synthesis, preventing cell membrane formation and causes increased membrane permeation. Fancy way of just saying that uh, it weakens uh, the fungi. And you can use them for both systemic and superficial fungal infections. Uh, the big difference between the two, the polyenes that we just saw, is they work on the outside of the membrane to bind to sterols and increase permeation. And they're really toxic because they bind to the mammal sterol, cholesterol. Azoles work on the inside of the cell to prevent sterol formation and increase permeation. They're minimally toxic because only the, fungal, uh, only the fungi uptake them. An over-the-counter option is something like butenophene, which is lotrimin. It's a topical antifungal, so you could treat superficial mycoses. Uh, mycoses is a fancy way of saying fungal infection. Uh, it causes the fungus to create excessive squalene, which is normally converted to ergosterol, and then large amounts of that squalene is toxic to the fungi. Antimycobacterial agents, so uh, we're really talking about tuberculosis and the pathology. So they're a bacteria, they're covered in this kind of waxy mycolic acid shell, and that's what gives them the name mycobacteria. Uh, they need oxygen-rich environments, so they want to be uh, in the lungs, and they are respiratory infectors. And both versions of TB must be treated. So the one that's controlled by the immune system, the latent tuberculosis, can't be spread, there's no symptoms. But then there's that which is uncontrolled by the immune system. Active tuberculosis easily spread and causes mortality. There are a number of options that we have, and multiple medications are used at the same time, usually three to four, to prevent inadequate drug therapy. So TB can become resistant to a single med very easily, but it leads to multi-drug resistance. So TB grows very slowly, and most antibiotics target fast replicating cells. So the four biggies are rifampin, rifidin, isoniazid, INH, pyrazinamide, PZA, ethambutol, myambutol. Use them for six to 18 months continuously depending on the combination. So a little more detail on each of these. Rifampin prevents RNA synthesis, causes this harmless orange red coloration to the bodily fluids. Isoniazid inhibits mycolic acid synthesis, preventing cell wall formation. Pyrazinamide disrupts cell wall, cell membrane function and transport, and then ethambutol inhibits cell wall formation as well. Antiviral agents, we'll start with some OTC and non-HIV agents. So the targets of an antiviral, uh, these are obligate parasites, which means that they're challenging to treat. They, re they have an obligation to the host, so they re rely entirely upon the host cells and synthetic commands for replication. 
So there's viral, viral attachment and entry where palivizumab works, and this is for RSV or respiratory syncytial virus. Uh, there's the nucleic acid synthesis where acyclovir and val acyclovir work, and then viral re release where oseltamivir and zanamivir work. So those three are the big ones, and those are the ones that we're really uh, targeting when we're talking about non-HIV infections. So with influenza, uh, obviously prevention through flu zone, flu mist, which I believe came back, uh, it changes yearly to best predict the prevalent strains, and it's given as an IM injection or an intranasal mist. Whereas once someone has the influenza, uh, treatment is with the neuro neuraminidase inhibitors, uh, like oseltamivir, which is brand Tamiflu, zanamivir, which is Relenza. Uh, that's an inhalation delivery, so sometimes difficult for patients to uh, use it. Uh, but both are effective. Uh, they prevent viral release from the host cell, and unfortunately they're ineffective if you give them more than 48 hours after showing symptoms. So someone that waits to go and get treatment, unfortunately it might be too late. HSV and VZV, so herpes simplex virus and varicella zoster virus, uh, acyclovir and valacyclovir. Acyclovir stops viral replication by inhibiting nucleic acid production. It's available as oral and IV formulations. On the other side, valacyclovir has the same mechanism as acyclovir, but it's only available as oral tablets. So it kind of depends on how you need to get it to the patient. Respiratory syncytial virus, or RSV, uh, it's a virus that causes respiratory infections, usually seasonally, and it's called brand Synergis, and it's a monoclonal antibody. You can see that by the MAB at the end of the name. But the key is that it affects these premature infants and young children with chronic lung diseases. So this is what it's meant to do. And it's a monthly injection given through the winter months. HIV antivirals, we really want to look at how this all happens, and that's how we can know where they work. So an HIV replication cycle is to attach, to fuse. We have reverse transcription, replication, integration, transcription, translation, assembly, then budding off in HIV protease processing. What we want to first look at is, okay, well, what step are they stopping things at? And if you look at the cellular, and this is why we, we call them CCR5s, but cellular chemokine receptor 5 antagonist, like Maraviroc, which is cell entry, uh, some HIV strains require the CCR5 to gain entry to the cell. Maraviroc binds to the CCR5, preventing the virus from entering the cell. On the other end, you've got the fusion inhibitor, and fuvertide, which is fusion, and this prevents the virus from fusing with the cell membrane. So we're halting that step two. When we talk about, and this is getting a little deep into the acronyms, but NNRTI, NRTIs, the non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor with the nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors, NRTI, Efavirenz, emtricitabine, and tenofovir, which is a tripla, so you have three drugs, that's where the trip comes from. Efavirenz is an NNRTI, it binds to an enzyme responsible for reverse transcriptase. It changes the structure of the new DNA formed to be faulty, so it doesn't work. Emtricitabine and tenofovir, both are NRTIs, that nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor, and they're incorporated into DNA at the reverse transcription step and causing faulty DNA to be produced. The next one, step five, is the integrase strand transfer inhibitor. So raltegravir uh, integrase is an enzyme halted or used by the HIV virus to insert its viral DNA into host DNA and take over host production mach machinery. So the integrase strand transfer inhibitors halt this process. And then there are the HIV antivirals protease inhibitors. So darunavir, uh, this is the last step in the HIV replication. Uh, processing by HIV protease. Without protease, the virus is inert and unable to infect other host cells. Protease inhibitors prevent the viral mu mu maturation and they're very effective. So again, when looking at HIV, we really look at where it happens and then how we match those drugs to that area.